All right. Good morning. Uh, page 295, hymn 497, Psalm 139, 1 through 17, and uh, the gospel for this Sunday, which is Pentecost. So let's begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. In the morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. My mouth is filled with your praise. And with your glory all the day. O Lord, open my lips. And my mouth will praise. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Hymn 497. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. Where shall I go from your spirit? Where shall I flee from your presence? If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, if I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night. Even the darkness is not dark to you, the night is bright as the day. For you form my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed 
substance, in your hope for the day that will come for me, when I said that were not in heaven. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Gospel reading for this coming Sunday is from John chapter 15 and 16. And uh, we'll start at verse 26. Jesus said, But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. I have said all these things to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. But I have said these things to you that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me. And none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you, and he will come. But when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father, and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Almighty and ever-living God, you fulfilled your promise by sending the gift of the Holy Spirit to unite disciples of all nations in the cross and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ. By the preaching of the gospel, spread this gift to the ends of the earth, through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Gracious Heavenly Father, you are the great physician of body and soul. You chasten and you heal. We ask that you be with Dennis this morning as he goes through surgery. That you would uh, be with the oral surgeon as he performs this for Dennis's good. We also pray for all those who are suffering the loss of loved ones. We pray for Diane and Ron Meyer as they mourn the death of Diane's brother. We also pray that you would be with the Horvat family as they mourn the loss of their son, Jensen. Surround uh, the Lutheran High community with your grace, your love, and mercy, reminding them that you are the resurrection and the life. And with your word, you can change everything from death to life. We ask this all for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul in all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, before I forget, this will be our last class today, because next week I'll be gone to the 8th grade field trip to the Dells. 
So we'll just have this as our last class today and wrap it up until the fall. Um, and uh, with that in mind, I thought we'd just kind of bring this whole thing with prayer together by talking about, um, if, did you all bring this sheet with these, this tome with you? Does anybody need a copy? I have an extra copy here. Extra copies. And I thought we'd talk today about, uh, actually talk about the prayer offices and um, <laughs> the gift that they are uh, to us. So if you go into, um, it says, do you need one? Roger, there you go. I opened it up. Okay. I have plenty of these, so you might as well take them. It says the daily office. It's toward the back, and there's a picture of um, there's a picture of a cross and a crown. I guess one of the things I'd, I'd like to start with that um, the gift of uh, of our hymnal um, is that it conclude it includes a, n a number of uh, of the daily offices, the daily prayers. Uh, both for the church at large and also for individuals and families. And I think one of the great blessings uh, that we've has been added to um, the Lutheran service book is that uh, you'll note just on, for instance, page, page 295, where we were just at, there's always a reference to the scriptures in there, where this is coming from the Bible. And if you look through the prayer offices, if you look through the divine services, you'll see that... Um, Uh, Ninety-nine percent of everything that we say and do in the in the prayer offices and the divine service is from the scriptures. Um, so when we when we pray, we're simply saying back to God what He has said to us. Um, that's our confession. Oh Lord, open my lips and my mouth will speak Your praise. So it is the Lord putting His own word on our lips so that we may speak to him what he has said to us. And I, I think that's, that's pretty incredible, that 99% is actually from the scriptures. Uh, number, this is quite a while ago, and it wasn't even here at this, it wasn't here, but um, somebody came up to me and said, I don't like the liturgy. And I said, I'm, I'm, I'm really saddened for you, because what you're telling me is that you don't like the Bible. <laughs> right because this is these are the words that we have been given uh, from the scriptures themselves and also from the mouths of, of the prophets uh, the apostles and the martyrs and we join with them in that in that uh, song I, just to give us a, a little bit of reference to that if you'd open up to um, in the hymnal if you'd open up to one of the greatest canticles uh, of the church to page 223 the Te Deum Laudamus. Uh, te Deum is Latin for um, we praise you, O oh God. We acknowledge you to be the Lord. And in this, this, by the way, was uh, Martin Luther's uh, favorite canticle of the church. Um, he actually wrote a musical setting to it which isn't in our hymnal, but um, it, it's in another, another uh, one of our supplements. And um, he cherished this right next to the creeds. In fact, he called it another creed of the church. And I think the beautiful thing that this canticle does, it shows us that when we pray, we're not alone, but we join in a great company of those who are in heaven, who join us in our prayers around the Lamb of God. And just to read through the text, uh, we praise you, O God. We acknowledge you to be the Lord. All the earth now worships you, the Father everlasting. To you all angels cry aloud, the heavens and all the powers therein. To you cherubim and seraphim continually do cry, Holy, 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 Lord God of Sabaoth. Heaven and earth are full of the majesty of your glory. The glorious company of the apostles praise you. The goodly fellowship of the prophets praise you. Uh, the noble army of martyrs praise you. The holy church throughout all the world does acknowledge you. The father of an infinite majesty, your adorable, true, and only son. Also the Holy Ghost, the comforter. You are the king of glory, O Christ. You are the everlasting son of the father. When you took upon yourself to deliver man, you humbled yourself to be born of a virgin. 
When you had overcome the sharpness of death, you opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers. You sit at the right hand of God in the glory of the Father. We believe that you will come to be our judge. We therefore pray you to help your servants, whom you have redeemed with your precious blood. Make them to be numbered with your saints in glory everlasting. O Lord, save your people and bless your heritage. Govern them and lift them up forever. Day by day we magnify you, and we worship your name forever and ever. Grant, O Lord, this day to keep us without sin. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us. O Lord, let your mercy be upon us, as our trust is in you. O Lord, in you have I trusted. Let me never be confounded. When was this I can't answer that question with um, a definite answer. Well, it's like a creed. It was. Yeah. Now this doesn't have a reference, like a Bible verse. No, it's but you can. Collected. Yeah, you can see it coming through, right? I mean, it's, but it's very old. I would assume. It's very ancient. Um, I don't know the date on that. I can't. I don't, I'd have to give, give you a reference on how how far it goes back. I know it's before. Uh, it's before the time of Luther. So it could be like at the time of the Nicene Creed, or I would say it would. I mean, I'd be, I'd be, I'd be lying to you if I gave you a date. <laughs> so uh, that's something that um, maybe, well, if I was with a bunch of younger people, they could do a, a series search on on your computer and see when was the today I'm written. Anybody, you're not into that. <laughs> um, what does the word canticle mean? Canticle means song. Oh. Okay. Yeah, it's a it's a song. Um, uh, <coughs> So canticle, and the one who leads the canticle is the cantor, right? The, the chief singer in the congregation um, will lead the singing. So, um, uh, yeah, great questions. Um, this, this particular tune, Roger, I think is, uh, this setting, musical setting of it is very Anglican, right? Um, you, you, you just hear it in a big cathedral. We praise you, O God. We acknowledge you to be the Lord. But there are other settings of it. Uh, one of the other ones that has become a, fa a favorite in our church now is hymn number 941, right? Um, to the tune Faxit, Faxit, which how many of you are uh, classical music aficionados? Huh? Dick was, right? Dick Hieronymus, yeah. Um, Gustav Holst's uh, great symphony on the planets, right? This is where this tune comes from. Yeah. We praise you and acknowledge you, O God, to be the Lord, the Father everlasting, I all the earth adored. To you, all angel powers, cry aloud, the heavens sing. The cherubim and seraphim, their praises to you bring. O holy, 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 Lord God of Sabaoth, your majesty and glory fill the heavens and the earth. Uh, the text was is a... Uh, paraphrase of the Te Deum, written by Pastor Stephen Starkey. You can see his name there at the bottom, who is a, a Missouri Synod Lutheran pastor in Bay City, Michigan, uh, real close to where Brian Heinlein is at. And then the, uh, the one right next to it, hymn 940, is uh, Holy God, We Praise Thy Name. It is uh, uh, a Latin text again. Uh, this is actually a Luther hymn. Um, and uh, it was in the first Lutheran hymnal, uh, and has become a part a part of our. Um, this one is a little bit. And there's a, there's another one, 939, which I don't think we've ever used. Um, another setting of it by Richard Hillert, who is. Uh, I think Richard's still living. He's a professor at Concordia University, Chicago, but there's another. Uh, version of it so um, so going uh, to, to so when we pray we're not praying alone um, and our prayer is always based on the Word of God now I'm gonna just kind of tear through this a little bit I'm not gonna read it but um, we'll give you uh, a little bit of a taste of 
how this all came to be. Christian prayer is rooted in the word of God. We hear the voice of God through the Holy Scriptures. As we receive this word from God, the heart of faith desires to respond. It is out of this receiving of God's word and the desire to respond that conversation with God, which is prayer, happens. The ancient form of structured prayer through the day, often called the daily office or the liturgy of hours, is not simply a way to encourage Christians to pray. Rather, it is a tool developed by the church to instruct us in prayer and faith, a means to keep our conversation with God rooted in his word. And uh, I think just simply the title, um, The Daily daily Office. What is an office? I'm just glad I'm not in one anymore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what did you do in an office? I was an insurance agent. Yeah. Okay. And you? You worked. <laughs> right? Performing a certain task, isn't it? Performing a task, right? Um, a vocation. So I am in the office of the holy ministry, which is passed on down to us, forgiven to us by the church through means of a divine call, right? Um, I am in the office of the holy ministry here at Trinity. Um, so an office is a place where we go and perform a vocation. So our vocation as Christians is to be a holy priesthood, right? Luther championed that. Uh, we are the priesthood of all believers. believers, right? And what do priests do in the Old Testament? Offer sacrifices. They offered sacrifices, right? Blood sacrifices um, for the atonement for their sins. But what was the other sacrifice that the high priest did? Prayer. He offered prayers, right? Um, and they would go into the Holy of Holies. And uh, from Psalm 141, let my prayers rise before you as incense. So they would um, use incense for a couple of different reasons. One is to cover the stench of the blood in the temple. <laughs> and the other was the symbolism of the prayer rising up to heaven and the sweet smell of our prayers going to God. He loves to hear our prayers. He rejoices in them. So it's an office. It's a place where we go to perform our priestly duty of offering our sacrifices of prayer and thanksgiving before the throne of God. Um, we understand the priesthood differently than the Roman Catholics do. What do they call their pastors? They call them fathers, yeah, which is which is a tender term. It's, it's actually a beautiful term. Lutherans are uncomfortable with that, <laughs> right? Um, I have some that call me father. <laughs> my children, right? Yeah. Um, but that's the whole, I mean, the, the, spiritual, the spiritual father. Um, they call it a priest because they believe that when, when the, they call the sacrifice of the mass, that every time the priest offers a mass, which, by the way, they have to do that every day. It's required of them. Even when they're retired, they have to offer a daily sacrifice. And they believe that every time the priest offers, a, offers or says the mass, that he is offering up a sacrifice for the sins of the people. Um, Gesundheit. If you would go to uh, Holy Name, I was there yesterday, I took the seventh graders there. They will have in their bulletin this week the the sacrificial mass will be said for the soul of, i'll pick on dick Hieronymus, right because they believe that they are still in this purgatory and that these prayers and the sacrifice of the mass needs to be offered on their poor souls so that they can someday be in heaven they still do it in fact i was there yesterday um Father Roberto over there was performing his daily mass. Okay. Uh, we believe as Lutherans from the scripture that that sacrifice is completed, right? Jesus' sacrifice on the cross was the final sacrifice. And we call it the sacrament. Now Jesus gives us of that sacrament of his body and blood in within and a bread and wine. So when we refer to this 
priesthood, we're not talking about the office of the holy ministry. We're talking about your, your vocation as a priest to pray for the needs of others. This all come, yeah, question, yeah. Does, does the Catholic Church still believe that that mass that they do, I mean, my brother and sister still pay for a mass, yep. a mass that for my mother who died 21 years ago. Why are they paying for it? Well, I'm thinking that it's a money scheme. <laughs> You look right through it, Diane. That's well. It it's a great stewardship program, but it's a lie. It's a lie. I mean, if they want to remember her, just put flowers on the altar. You know. You're preaching to the or choir. Donate something to the church. Uh, yeah. The reason is is because this is their penance. They have when you talk to a Catholic. Uh, and even a Catholic priest or a Catholic nun, they will tell you that I hope I will be in heaven. Yes, we went to a funeral. Right? Yeah, they, they talk about hope. Yeah. If I talk to Roger and say, Roger, if you die today, where are you going to be? He's going to be in heaven. Why? Sure. It's a sure thing. Jesus paid the price, right? I'm with him. And so, <clears throat> you, you imagine, I mean, it's, it's, it's really, it's not a clean conscience. And so, when do you know when you've paid enough? And it's sad to go to a Catholic funeral. It is. That it's just talks about hope. Yeah. It's 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 actually depressing because yeah. you ne you never know. You never are certain if you've done enough. And it's still alive and well. Um, so that's that's what they what they do. They they pay for it. By the way, I, um, if you want to get a, an annulment in the Roman Catholic Church, that is something else. Um, Heather Leipom, uh, gave she had a friend who was trying to get an annulment, and she had to fill out, she was supposed to fill out like these 10 pages, um, and then they take it to the tribunal in Rome that goes through, and annulment says that this marriage never happened, right? Uh, when you have children, <laughs> you know, it happened. Um, again, it's it is a it's a it's a money scheme. Well, I was just wondering, you know, do the Catholic priests really believe that it's doing something? They do. Mm -hmm. Boy, Satan really can put blinders on. You. I just took a class um, through uh, the John Paul II Institute uh, for the Theology of the Body. I just gave this book to Lois. It's a great read, but um, the theology of the body, how the body is, um, is you know, God's design. It's, it, God created us as his temple and, and, and through the gift of love and marriage. And it was a great class, but there was a lot of weird stuff through the Roman Catholic, a lot of mysticism and, and, and kind of weird. You just have to kind of sort through all that. And the Gospels... The gospel's there. Um, I mean, the Catholic Church is a Christian church. The, you know, the way I like to explain it is, um, so they're not going to see me, but I want to get a, I want to get a, you know, this is my empty, right? And I need the gospel. So I can do it like this. Right? There's a little trickle or some drops, or we can have it like this. Right? In the Roman Catholicism, you are going to get a trickle of the gospel it, with all of the other hocus pocus that goes on. Um, Luther wanted to have the spout open and to give the fullness of the gospel. Right? Um, so, uh, a lot of great things in that church. I, believe me, it's beautiful. I, and I took the kids, and they were they're audited. But then they asked me, "Well, what's all that stuff on the side?" Well, this is where they have all the relics. You know, here's a piece of the tooth of of um, Saint Nicholas. And they said, "Oh, inside. Guess what's inside of the altar over there? Holy name, the holy name of Jesus. A piece of the cross, of the original cross. And and so they have this reliquary on the side. 
Um, and then they take those relics out and they venerate them on the, on the particular saint's day. I remember seeing a catalog where you could buy, you know, I always just say, $9.95, you can have a little tiny tube yeah. of something. And I just thought it was silly, but. If you want to sell your house, you know what you do? Yeah, you you buy a St. Joseph statue, you get buried upside down, and... Um, My sister-in-law and I were just talking about some of these things, and she was brought up Catholic. Yeah. And uh, one question that came up, and maybe you can, can answer that, uh, when you are cremated, and she had my brother cremated, um, you can get a little vial of dust of ashes and how did, how did she say that she said you know the catholic church says that you can't separate the ashes and i'm thinking i don't know the real answer on this but that's pretty powerful you know for when he comes at the end of the the end of the world his second coming I'm sure he can find a speck of dust somewhere <laughs> and put it all together. That's a that's a whole other topic. I don't wanna, I don't want to open that <laughs> that up right now. That's a whole theology to itself. Yeah. The, the sad thing is, as out there at every Sunday, the gospel is proclaimed in our church directly, right, overtly, completely, and still people don't understand. Yeah. How could they possibly? It, given that there's a little trickle of something in the Catholic Church, there's so much other junk. It just seems like it would be very, very hard to focus on the little bit of gospel. Well, he, he, this is the, the, so the bizarre thing that happened with the theology of the body, which is all based on John Paul II's tome, and, and he was, John Paul II was, was, was right about this. Um, but, so when they, at the end of every lecture, they would always bring the vial of some of the blood of John Paul II out and then pray to him <laughs> and venerate him. And I was like, really? <laughs> so it just, you know, you go through these lectures and at the end of it, it's just like, you just ruined the whole thing um, because it wasn't focused on where the focus needs to be, the, the em emphasis. So you're right, Roger. I mean, any, any kind of pulling away from that um, is, is, it's really, it's sad. We have a tendency to focus on the small things, don't we? Right. In our lives, instead of the big things, little things that come up that, that seems to get our attention. Yeah. We just kind of miss the big stuff. So we need to be focusing on the big stuff. And yeah. Not only right. The little things. Yeah. So let's look at the Old Testament, just kind of the background of this. Praying at appointed times during the day is traced back to the Old Testament practice of praying at fixed hours. God commanded the Israelites' priests to offer morning and evening sacrifices. Let's look at Exodus, Exodus chapter. Um, Exodus chapter 29, verses uh, 38 through 39. The right place. Okay. Now, this is what you shall offer on the altar. Two lambs, a year old, day by day, regularly. One lamb you shall offer in the morning, and the other lamb you shall offer at, at twilight. And then skip to chapter 30, verses 6 through 8. Um, this is talking about the altar of incense. I'm going to go back to verse 1. You shall make an altar in which to burn incense. You shall make it of acacia wood. A cubit shall be its length and a cubit its breadth. It shall be square and two cubits shall be its height. Its horn shall be of one piece. You shall overlay it with pure gold. Its top around its side and its horns. You shall make a molding of gold around it. You shall make two golden rings for it under its molding on two opposite sides. You shall make them, and they shall be holders for the poles with which to carry it. You shall make the poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. And you shall put it in front of the veil that is above the ark of the testimony, in front of the mercy seat that is above the testimony, where I will, where I will meet you. And Aaron shall burn fragrant incense on it. Every morning when he dresses the lamps, he shall burn it. And when Aaron sets up the lamps at twilight, he shall burn it. A regular incense offering before the Lord throughout your generations. Uh, you shall not offer unauthorized incense as a bird offering or a grain offering, um, and you shall not pour a drink offering on it. Aaron shall make atonement on its horns once a year. With the blood of the sin of the offering of atonement, he shall make atonement for it once a year throughout your generations. 
it is most holy to the Lord. So you see this specific business about um, in, in, in the morning and in the evening. Uh, Psalm, chapter, Psalm 1 also talks about this. Uh, Psalm 1 <coughs> instructs us, uh, which we sang last week in church, Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not at the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the skeet, seat, in the skeets, hello, in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. And this law is, uh, we, as Lutherans, we talk in categories of law and gospel. When we think of the law, we think of the Ten Commandments, right? But the Torah included law and gospel. It was the wholeness of scripture. That's what the word law is, Torah. So when the sacrifices were offered during, um, uh, this is a paragraph in, or a sentence right after Psalm 1 too. When sacrifices were out loud during Israel's forced exile in Babylon, prayer services were developed in the synagogue as sacrifices of praise. Upon the return of the Jewish people to, Ju to Judea, those prayer services were brought into the temple. In addition to the prayers accompanying the morning and evening sacrifices, there was a prayer at the third, sixth, and ninth hours of the day. Uh, Psalm 119, uh, 164 talks about this. Psalm 119, 164. And here's where you get the reference. Seven times a day, I praise you for your righteous rules. Grant peace, great peace, have those who love your law. Nothing can make them stumble. I hope for your salvation, O Lord, and I do your commandments. My soul keeps your testimonies. I love them exceedingly. I keep your precepts and testimonies, for all my ways are before you. So that's seven times a day. Much evidence suggests that the structured schedule of prayer, a feature of liturgical life at the time of Christ, was passed on down to the early church, providing the form if not the content for the daily, the daily prayers. Although Christians no longer shared the temple sacrifices which had been fulfilled in Jesus Christ, they were devoted to the prayers. Uh, Acts 2.42 talks about that. Uh, take a peek there, Acts chapter 2, verse 42. <clears throat> And they, namely the, the, the disciples, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to the prayers, right? There's a definite article there. This wasn't just some sort of uh, something they came up with, but these were, these, this was an order that they followed, a pattern from the temple. Some versions just say prayer. Right. That's really a miss. It's a miss. There's a definite article there. It's um, in the Greek. This is information that is kind of trivial, but um, there's 24 ways to say the in Greek, right? When I was learning Greek, um, I had to learn those, and I still know them to this day, because I, I put it to a song. Ha hei ta tu teis tu to te to tan te ta ha hoi hai ta ton 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 tois tais tois tu sta sta. So those are all the 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 the. We call it the the song. But yeah, there is a definite article there, which which makes us think that definitely that these were. These were structured prayers, which they would have taken with them from the Old Testament, the Psalms, right? That was their prayer book. But Pastor, yeah. I mean, God must have given them these rituals for a reason. Mm -hmm. And now the Catholic Church is doing a lot of rituals. So mm -hmm. what is the reason for them? Oh, they'll have a reason for lots of them. No, I mean in the Old Testament. Oh, yeah. What was the reason for the rituals? Uh, what, what's the reason for a ritual? Memory. Yeah. So you don't forget the stuff repeat stuff over and over and over again. Right? It's, um, for instance, when you gather together for your grandchildren's birthdays, what do you sing? Yeah, happy birthday, happy cake. <laughs> it, it's, it's a liturgy. It's a pattern. It's good for us, right? Um, we need that structure, that, that, um, that discipline. And so God gave them, I mean, when he, told, when he 
had them built the temple, he was very specific. This is how it was to be done. When he told them to wear robes, he got down to the very threads. Um, this, is what, this is what was holy, this is what was not holy. Um, and so we're very cautious about that we follow, you know, they're, they're, uh, there's, there's this fine line between what's secular and what's sacred, right? Um, but in the New Testament, the rituals were... They were still there. Were they? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's, if I yeah, give you a book to read, it's called um, the, um, the Early Christians and, and How They Prayed. Um, they, they, it was very structured. I mean, they gathered together in the house. They had, they had an altar or a table. Um, they, they, would, they would sing the Psalms. Um, in fact, the, the most ancient, uh, the two most ancient parts in our, in our liturgy are um, the uh, Sanctus, right? Which is the words of Isaiah uh, when he was in the temple and he was burning incense he was scared to death um, because one of his predecessors, King Uzziah, was struck dead for, in, in the temple. And he didn't want to die. So he said, woe is me. I am a, I'm an unclean man and I dwell in the midst of an unclean people. Why, why am I in this, in this holiness of God? Right? And he saw, the, he saw the, 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 the majesty of God. And he sang those words, holy, 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 Lord God of Sabaoth, the Lord God of this heavenly army. Heaven and earth is full of your glory. So those Christians took that right into their liturgy and, and sang those songs. Um, so those, just the, the, the very structure that they would have, the reading of the Torah, and then they would have a, a, they would have a sermon, and then they would, at the end of it, the structure was always um, word, and meal, or we would say word and sacrament, right? So they would read the scriptures, and then the, the, the rabbi or the teacher, the, the apostle, would have a mishnah, which is, uh, what does this mean? It was a sermon where there would be catechesis, there would be the teaching of the scriptures, just like Jesus did on the road to Emmaus. He sat down, he, he went through all of the scriptures, he taught them where he was throughout all the Old Testament. Where's Jesus in this? And then after the catechesis, he sat down and he broke bread and their eyes were opened. So the pattern is always word and then meal, teaching, teaching and then eating. In fact, in the early church, what they would do after the reading of the word, those uh, neophytes, those new, new Christians, um, and, and the Greek Orthodox still, church still does this. They would, uh, they would, they would cry out, "With wisdom, attend the doors." And what that meant was, all of those who had not been baptized and taught the faith were then dismissed from the meal, and were taken into a separate room like this. And that's where they would teach the the, the catechumens the faith until they were brought in through baptism and. Uh, through baptism and, and confirmation, and then we're, we're, we're then invited to the meal. Um, my, one of the congregations that my dad served as a principal good shepherd in Elgin, Illinois, which now is recently closed, unfortunately. Um, but they had that practice yet back in the 80s, where right after the offering, the pastor would give a benediction, and then they would come through and dismiss all those who weren't going to communion. Well. I think it actually became a, a reason because the bears were playing at <laughs> whatever time, and this was an excuse to get home. It had lost that 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 idea of now they're taken down to be taught. I mean, we we actually are, have a pattern of that now, um, and one of the reasons we've moved our our new member class um, in between services is this same idea. You go to church, you come down, you're catechized, or you go. To, to catechism class of the pastor, and then you go up to church. So it's that, it's that idea of that. Um, did anybody else have that, where they would dismiss people after the offering? No, no one else. You, you, Dennis, you remember that? Yeah, I mean, it was like for communion. Yeah, what, what church was? Well, it was my dad's church in Colorado. That was still... They still did that. Well, that was in the 60s, maybe 70s, before they... 
Yeah. Yeah, it was it was a practice. It was a vestige of that. Um, is there? Is it? I don't think there's a just. Oh, maybe there. Is. Let's let's let, let's take a peek at that. I don't know what it. I don't really. Dennis. Yes. Uh, it would be in divine service uh, one or two. Yeah. Okay. Page. Look at page one seventy six. The only the only thing that it states. Uh, 175, following the prayers, the people may greet one another in the name of the Lord, saying, Peace be with you, as a sign of reconciliation of the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Then the offering and the offertory, and then it just says, there's that little note there, if there is no communion, the service concludes with the Lord's Prayer, or a concluding collect and the benediction. So, yeah, that, they did that, and, and then they would just, then they would go on with communion, and then, <laughs> I always thought it was funny to watch the people the congregation and then everybody else would, would stay in their seats but it's a vestige of that teaching I have an interesting comment yeah. on that because years ago when Chuck and I were young and had little kids we had to leave church early for whatever yep. and this was before the um, uh, the blessing had begun to help. and we were handed this envelope by the usher <laughs> We got home, and here's this letter from the pastor about how you shouldn't leave before the end of the service and receive the blessing of the day. And why I remember this, who knows? But it just well, that's it, memorable. That is, well, that is <laughs> Isn't that something? You know, of course we were. It was in um, Rock Island, Illinois, so the Cubs and the Bears were a hundred and some miles away. So it wouldn't be that we're running out for the game. Yeah. <laughs> but it was. Yeah. They didn't want us leaving. They wanted us to the end. They want you to stay. Uh, nowadays, your phone would tell you, oh, you left church early. You better go. <laughs> Give a tax. You're right, Roger. You're right. Um, anyway, the, so the daily office, plow through this here a little bit. The, the chief purpose for the practice of the daily office is the sanctifi sanctification and marking of time. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows in the morning, lest he suddenly... And find, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. In the ancient world, the time between dawn and dusk was divided at recognized points, the third, the sixth, and the ninth hours. And Christians found it natural to mark the passing of time with prayer at these times. For the most part, these times were prayers were, were private or family prayers within the home. By the middle of the third century, the hours of prayer had become commemorations of the work of Christ. Daybreak, daybreak celebrated the resurrection. The third hour, the condemnation of Christ. The sixth hour, the crucifixion. Uh, the ninth hour, uh, Jesus' death. Evening, the rest in the tomb, or the light of Christ in the darkness of the world. With this development, it became common for the liturgy of hours to be prayed by the congregation, gathered together for this purpose. Over time, these divine offices became increasingly elaborate as they became the exclusive property of the monastic communities, since the chief vocation of the monks was that of prayer. During the Middle Ages, an elaborate system of canonical hours, schedule of prayers, ordered by the Roman Catholic, Roman Catholic canon law, which means they have to do it, was prescribed as a part of the monastic vocations in the various orders of the clergy. Originally, the hours of liturgy of hours distribute um, time throughout the day, and here you can see it. Um, so midnight, um, matins, you get up at 3 a.m. in the morning, you pray louds. At 6 o'clock, it's time to prime your pump, and you pray pine. At 9, that's the, th that's the third hour of the terse, third hour of the day, noon, which is sext, and then at three o'clock you come back and you pray uh, nun, and at six o'clock you come back and you play, pray vespers, and then at 9 p.m. before you go to bed, you pray Compline, and that's the routine of monasticism, every day. So if you would make yourself a committee of one or two and go to Holy Hill, this is what you would experience in the monastic life. Yep. You go to bed at midnight, or at, at nine, and you wake up at midnight, and you go back to bed, and you get up at three, and you sleep for another three hours. And... That's it's normal. Normal. It sounds normal. <laughs> <laughs>
What do they do before alarm clocks? The bells. Chapel bells. Yeah, well, they would each be assigned their various duties. And so you go and you ring the bells and um, you wake them up. <laughs> um, and if you, Concordia Mequon still has the cell, uh, Augsburg dormitory was where the, where you lived when you were in seclusion. And there are these little tiny closets, you know, that, that they lived in. And, and that was their, that was their routine. It's said that the nuns over there, because they have all those hallways, would actually roller skate to the chapel. Oh. They get there quicker. Yeah, they had roller skates. Oh, for goodness sake! I mean, they have the little fun if they're Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Reforms of the schedule and content of the daily office had occurred throughout the century since the Reformation, most notably by Lutherans and Anglicans. Both communities greatly simplified the daily office. For example, the midnight office of Matin was aggregated with laws. A slightly later development often admitted prime and celebrated and aggregated matins law, laws as a sole early morning prayer. Uh, services called matins or morning prayer, vespers and compline were blended into the single evening service called <coughs> vespers or evensong. We call it evening prayer. The Anglicans and Lutherans ultimately took different approaches to the reform of the daily office. Under the Anglican reforms, the office has retained an essentially monastic character. All 150 psalms are appointed to be read during the course of a month. Nearly the entire Bible is read throughout each year, and the priests in the Church of England are required to read morning and evening daily prayer in their parish church, if possible. So if you go over to Grace Episcopal, they have um, their priest always, every day they have matins and evensong um, that he will perform. Martin Luther took matins and vespers out of the monastery and formulated these two prayer services for congregational use. While both services focus on praise and reflection of scripture, Luther's modification made matins and vespers ideal for preaching offices. Lutherans have seldom felt compelled to use all 150 psalms within a prescribed period of time, nor do they read the whole Bible each year in the course of these services. As a result, through the rhythm of daily prayer, sunrise to sunset as present, matins and vespers, as preaching services tend to offer a stronger emphasis on the progress of the church year, as, this, as the propers of the Sundays and seasons of the church year are, are used in, the Lutherans, in services and in the sermon. Among the Lutherans, other daytime prayer offices were completely lost. Um, so we, we, I mean, like this morning, uh, we'll have, uh, actually I think we're using the service of prayer and preaching, but um, normally for our chapels we have matins and when we have um, Lent and Advent, we have matins in the morning and vespers in the evening with preaching. But those are the, those are kind of the, um, the idea of it. I, this is where Luther was actually a master. Um, the two, the prayer offices, if you open the catechism up to page, um, page 327. And he wrote these, these prayers here so that anybody, whether you were a butcher, a baker, a candlestick maker, a farmer, uh, whatever, that when you get up in the morning, right, this is matins, uh, make the sign of the Holy Cross, say in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, then kneeling or standing, repeat the creed, the Lord's Prayer, and then you may say Luther's little prayer, right? I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ. You learned it in catechism class. And then at the end of the day, when you go to bed, make the sign of the cross, then kneeling or standing, repeat the creed, the Lord's Prayer, and then you may also say this prayer. Um, and then I commend you, uh, I commend myself, let your holy angel be with me that the evil foe may have no power over me. Then go to sleep at once and in good cheer. And in the morning, he says, then go joyfully to your work. Sing a hymn like that of the Ten Commandments or whatever your devotion may suggest. So you see how he, how he took those prayer offices and brought them to the holy priesthood and made them very simple and easy to pray without the guilt. Okay. Um, individual, so if, if you wanted to, to do, uh, I mean, this is how it would, this is, in fact, at the seminaries, uh, at least in, in Fort Wayne, um, this is, they follow this, uh, uh, this, if you look on the right-hand column. Um, so they do matins, or they do a, a very early office. I think they do it at 7 a.m., and then at 10, at 10 o'clock, they have another liturgy. And then at, I don't think they do the noonday one. They have a mid-afternoon service, responsive prayer, and then they have a, an evening service, at, uh, either Vespers or, or Compline. Um, and so they have that 
for the seminarians who live on campus, you'll hear that chapel bell calling, uh, five, I think, five or six times a day. And they'll always have a group of, group of uh, people in that community. Um, turn to the last page. Uh, the daily office is not an isolated individual endeavor. Instead, it is a way for individual participants in the prayer life of the community, the church. Thus, one does not need to feel a burden to participate in a particular office every day or feel guilty because of a time of prayer was missed. Rather, when you miss a time you typically set aside for prayer, be conscious that prayer goes on as the people of God throughout the world call on their dear Father. If you decide to use the daily office as a whole or in any part, it is helpful to put time limits on when a particular office is prayed. If, for example, your discipline is to pray the primary hours of matins, morning prayer, vespers, and evening, you might decide not to pray matins until after 10 a.m. If you miss this time window, you can pick the discipline within the next office or whatever. In these matters, there are no laws. Rather, there is freedom in the gospel to use or not to use it according to one's needs and personal <laughs> piety. Um, so, uh, one of the nice, at the seminary, uh, you can actually go online, I think it's at 10 o'clock, 9 o'clock our time? Yeah, I think it changed. I, I it, think it's at... Yeah, Daily Chapel is on there. Chapel. And you can go in like, and, and join the seminary community. Also. Yeah. Um, any questions? If the priests or the ministers have the state of office, it's done whether there's people there or not. Right? I believe with you, or Yeah, you could wander into Grace sometime and see if he's there or not. <laughs> Re Redeemer in Fort Wayne does? They do matins yeah. and vespers every day. And they have, a few people. They have people there. Yeah, I did it. My, my first parish in Vermilion, it was a college town, so I did I did a, a daily, I, I lived, the parsonage was connected to the church, so I could literally walk out my door in my pajamas and be there, but uh, I didn't do it in my pajamas, but I would, I would do a morning and evening prayer. I'd bring my kids over there, and, and I'd have a couple of students that would show up a few times a week but we offered it, and I did it uh, early in the morning, like at seven o'clock, and then in the evening, um, like it was like at three thirty, four o'clock, and offered it. And there were students that came. I think in communities like that, where there are campuses, and well, at, at my last congregation in Kenosha, we had a daily chapel for the children. It was a short, abbreviated service, but it's the first thing we did when we gathered in the, in the morning. We do it here. I mean, our principal prays over the loudspeaker so it is a daily office they begin with prayer and they end with prayer it's just not as you know. so do the muslims you know, yes. they pray the five times a day is that from the old testament yeah yeah and they are very i mean that that they have to right if you don't stop because they're they're it's all legalism right so if you go into a muslim country um everything stops at those prayer hours and they face to the east, to Mecca. Uh, there's, what is there, five things that they have to do in a, a lifetime. They have to fast, they have to pray, they have to tithe. Um, what am I missing? They have to make a pilgrimage to Mecca at least once in their life. And there's one more, I know there's five, uh, five rules. I think it has something to do with the burqa. The burqa for women and men must not shave. Uh, is it? I, I don't know what that whole orthodox is, but there's something like that. And talk about a culture that treats women poorly. I mean, they're always, if you go into a Muslim culture, the women are always five feet behind the men. Um, so. Okay, anything else? Any other questions? So we'll, um, this will be our our swan song for today. Thanks for being a great class here. You're welcome. My pleasure. And um, we'll conclude with prayer. Blessed Lord God, who has caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant that we might read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, so that by the patience and comfort of your holy word we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.